We're in the midst of a huge transformation where our peers, communities, and workplaces are, are all really melding into one. My name is Christina Giordano. I'm a partnerships manager here at All Voices, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Today, I'm very excited to welcome our guest, Trinidad uh, Hermida, um, and she is the head of diversity inclusion at Niantic. How are you today? I'm amazing. How are you, Christina? I'm good. Thanks for being on our interview series today. If you want to start off by telling us a little bit about yourself, including your pronouns um, and the work you do as well. Hi, everybody. Trinidad Hermita here, pronouns she, her, and um, a little bit about myself. I'm a creative in a tech space. I am someone who believes that I lead with my heart more than uh, anything else. And I'm the head of diversity and inclusion at Niantic. And I'm proud to be here to represent Niantic and the innovative work that we're doing in this tech AR platform gaming space. That's awesome. And what when you're not working, what's a hobby that you enjoy doing outside of the office or virtual office? <laughs> I absolutely pre-pandemic love traveling. I love doing outdoor stuff. Uh, I love swimming. I love uh, just interacting with my friends and family and actually giving back to the community. I love coaching and uh, just doing things that are innovative. I don't know, new. I love tech, so I do that on my free time as well. Awesome. I also love to travel and I definitely miss it, but I'm excited for the future. Um, I would love to ask as well, like what motivated you to get into the space of diversity, equity, and inclusion? Hmm, what motivated me? I I really fell into this space, really. Uh, fun fact is I have my master's in theology. I'm an ordained minister and I was an executive assistant when I was doing my master's because it paid the bills. and. Uh, as an executive assistant to a CEO, I had a little bit of social capital. So I remember asking the CEO if we can go to this conference for women in Massachusetts. And I asked it, hey, can you send all your women, since there's not that many of us, to this conference? And he agreed, uh, fun fact. And so we all went. And when I went there, I was able to interact with some of the keynotes. And one of the keynotes in particularly, Jackie Glenn, who worked at EMC Squared, I approached her and I asked her, hey, can I um, take you out to dinner, take you out to lunch? And uh, I loved your keynote and I loved your points. And at that dinner lunch, she's like, hey, I think you should apply for my executive assistant role. And lo and behold, she's the chief diversity officer at uh, EMC Squared at the time. Um, before they were acquired by Dell. And that was insert my journey into diversity, equity, and inclusion. That's awesome. Shoot your shot and just ask for the opportunities, ask and you, you know, make the opportunity for yourself, which I think is really important too. Um, let's talk about Niantic and, you know, the company culture, and you seem to be really happy there as well. Uh, what really differentiates the culture um, at your company? The great thing about Niantic is we are a startup. And if you know anything about a startup culture, you have to be agile. You have to be willing to traverse new things and, and try new opportunities. And that's the beauty of DNI. Nobody has gotten it perfect in the 10 years that I've been in this space. So why not enter into a startup culture that is open to allowing us to try new things and fast fail and empower people with tools and knowledge to see if it impacts culture. So that's what we're doing at Niantic and I, and I love and appreciate that. Absolutely. I think being in an agile environment, be able to test things and have the opportunity and resources to do that and have someone who is working on this is really important. I know in a lot of conversations we have with folks, they're like, how do we measure the progress, even though we're not perfect, how would you, you know, measure the progress of your diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, strategy overall? Overall, I would say there's a couple ways that we can measure, but the most prominent that you see with practitioners is through survey results. It's measuring engagement. It's measuring knowledge. It's measuring if people are understanding the vision, if people are signed up for the vision, if people believe in the vision. So I think that survey results help that a lot for us to be able to see and then also break down the results by 
gender, ethnicity, department, so that we can see areas that may need more focus than others. So I'll, I'll stick with that one in general, but um, that's one of the many ways that we measure results. Yeah, absolutely. I think just asking employees and you're really keeping a pulse on what's happening too is super important. What role do you see, you know, trainings, whether it's company-wide, department-wide, events, programming, um, and employee resource groups really playing into a company's uh, equity strategy? Oh, I think they're, they're imperative. I think they're, if we don't, if we're not constantly training and educating, if we're not empowering our people to, to have a voice through our ERGs, if we're not allowing people to bring their true authentic selves and challenge authority or challenge leadership and, and in, in a way to empower and improve, um, I don't think we're tapping in. I do think though, that those are, those are engagement strategies. Those are areas for us to be able to invite people to the table. Uh, but I do think that there is a lot more to really seeing policy change, uh, direct action to systemic racism within HR or companies systems. Like that's another level. And um, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> No, absolutely. I think that it's definitely an important piece to the puzzle, but it's part of an overall 360 strategy too. And part of that as well is we're seeing a lot of folks at companies giving opportunities and making more opportunities accessible, especially with the pandemic and this remote world of work that we see ourselves in uh, today. Um, how are you thinking about the accessibilities of roles at uh, your company? So one, one great thing about Niantic is we value coming together because we're, we're collaborative culture. And so it's been really rough over the pandemic, but we've survived, we've come together, we've pulled together, but a lot of uh, our members are looking to go back so that they can collaborate in spaces. Um, we're also looking at possibly, and this is, this is an idea of like more of like a swing um, space so that we, so we can keep everybody safety and that teams can collaborate together. So making sure that they're coming in at the same time, but then also um, opening the doors for people who technically are just like, hey, I need to get out now. I need space now. And so we've already offered, gave that opportunity to some of our employees who may need um, other places to work other than their homes because their homes might be co-working spaces where there's like five roommates and you know and it's not imperative for them to have focus but uh we really do value coming together and and we do understand that we want to be safe we want people to feel empowered with the tools so that they can do their job well and also be open to a different future, right? Like our, we're never gonna have the norm that we had before. So being open and agile, like we said earlier, you know, fast fail. Like, hey, if we realize that this swing space isn't working, we're gonna, we're gonna reassess and we're gonna see if we need to move differently. Absolutely. And I think all to your point too, employees' needs are so different as well. Um, and it's really important to just have that listening and really be flexible with that and just like be able to fail fast, as you said, and try different, try different things, which is important. Another element to diversity, equity, and inclusion is belonging and that feeling of belonging in a new world of work. Um, how do you see an inclusive culture manifesting in both a virtual and in-person environment? I see it manifest through education. I, I truly believe that there is a huge disparity around what does it mean to invite people to the table, to bring people into the conversation. And I think that we've been practicing that with our, uh, with our Zoom calls and education around, hey, not everybody's an extrovert like me. Not everybody <laughs> wants to raise their hand and speak up in conversation. Sometimes you need to send the meeting notes ahead of time so people can engage, at least have that thought process because we're dealing with people with different abilities. So um, understanding that, I think in the, in the remote, like, virtual space. Uh, and then also when we start to transition in, I think this is something that we really have to pay attention to because we're still going to have that swing space where there's going to be people who are still virtual and people who are not. So making sure that we're not um, 
so excited once we get back into the office that we forget that we still need to preemptively make sure that we draw people in, preemptively make sure that if nobody's speaking, we give the room for those who may take a little bit more time to speak up. Um, and then also make sure that there's opportunities for people after the fact to engage if their processing is taking a little bit longer. Absolutely. I think it's really important to, like you said, just remember the space that we are in. And also when we return to quote unquote normal, or just like we are back in the office in some type of way, it's important to have that empathy for colleagues and recognize everybody's different abilities as well. And also that Zoom fatigue is definitely <laughs> real um, as well. So and just Sometimes, engage sometimes you don't want to put your camera on and yeah. that's okay. Like at least... I think the education piece is key and also being aware and empathetic. We need more empathetic managers. Yes, we need a bottom line. Yes, we need to reach that bottom line, but we are humans. Um, and I'm not going to talk to an article that came out today about another company, but like, <laughs> you know, just really like, hello. Yes, Pete, your people are your asset. And if you're not addressing what is bothering your people, you're not doing a service to your company. I don't care if you're a product focused company. I don't care if you're a project focused company. I don't care what kind of company you are. Yes, I just talked to the company because I have issues with what they put out in the public. But, you know, all that to say is like, we are a people focused company. And yes, we have a product that is dope that impacts millions. And we need to make sure that we do this product with excellence. But at the same time, if our people are hurting, if our people are tired, we need to recognize that as a company and assess to make sure that we provide opportunities for people to recharge, to, to be able to bring their authentic selves to work and feel like they belong. Because if, if I am at a company and my company says, you know, all lives matter, I'm going to be like, I don't belong here, you know, so there's, right. there's just understanding around that. Absolutely. And there are companies, and I think we're moving towards this as well, that are speaking up, they're engaging in these hard conversations. And even if they're not getting it right the first time, they are trying a second time and a third time and recognizing that we are full people. Um, I mean, right now we are in each other's homes or wherever we're working from as well. Um, and I think that the compartmentalizing personal life and work life just isn't a reality right now. I also think I know the company and article that you're referring <laughs> to as well. Um, and I just think that's, I think it's a crazy idea to just have it boxed out like this and have it siloed, um, like you said. So um, one of the other questions that's kind of related to this uh, conversation as well is just trends we're seeing over that we'll see over the next year in this space. How do you see corporate diversity, equity, and inclusion hopefully evolving? <laughs> I love this question because <laughs> real talk, real talk, we've been talking about this for 20 years, right? Like, and my issue with trends are the trends aren't changing. Mm -hmm. The trends are the same from 10 years ago. The trends are the same from when I was at EMC squared. The trends are the same from when I was at Dell. And if we keep on trekking to the same trends that are not showing results, we're insane. So companies need to empower their DNI practitioners from the CDO level all the way down to the inter individual contributor to be able to brainstorm, be innovative, fast fail, think outside the box. And if companies are not doing that, there it's a miss. It's performative. So when I think of the trends, Real talk, Christina, I think they're mostly performative. They they know, oh, hey, hey, DNI person, I want to hire a head of DNI. I'm gonna lower them at a program manager. And this is for the whole company, you know. And then I'm also gonna tell them, hey, I need some ERGs, I need some women's programs, and uh, yeah, a couple conferences. That's DNI in a box, y'all. And that's the wrong mentality because DNI practitioners have to be strategic. DNI practitioners have to bring people to the table. They have to have a worldview of the business, understand the business imperatives, understand what the baseline issues are, and they have to be able to come in and, and coach, advise, think outside the box, bring people to the table, empower them with tools, information, learning, all that kind of stuff. And we think that this is the, the job of a program manager. Get out of here. Absolutely. Get out of here. No, I think you're definitely right. And I would argue that, I mean, you said a bunch of different 
things that kind of encapsulate diversity, equity, and inclusion, but also I would argue it's not one person's specific job to make sure that everybody feels included at a company, because like you said, you want to bring people to the table and make them want to in their processes, in their day-to-day, and really encourage them to be, you know, DEI like champions and also think of it from an intersectional lens about everything that's happening as well in terms of acquiring uh, talent and retaining people, promoting folks, uh, like we talked about earlier as well, whether you're on Zoom or in person, engaging people in a conversation in meetings too. So it all relates. You can't just put things again in a box or compartmentalize this type of strategy. Um, another kind of question I would ask too, I'm sure folks who are listening right now are wondering like, what advice you have for people who want to join your team, if your like DEI team would be expanding in the future, um, or just like your general team at Niantic. I know one of the things that you probably are thinking are um, like folks who want to, you know, fail fast and just like try things and who are agile, but also wanted to hear a couple of your other uh, thoughts and advice for those folks. Uh, well, fun fact. I don't know when this is airing, but we are definitely hiring uh, HR people. Our HR team is expanding. Uh, Also, engineers always looking for y'all. If you love working on products that are are innovative, different, exciting that you can. uh, One thing about the game industry is it takes time to develop. So if you're looking for a product that you can see tomorrow on the market, uh, this is not the place because it takes years to develop a good game or years to develop a new platform. But if you wanna be someone who's coming in to empowered, that is empowered to think outside the box, please do apply at Niantic. Uh, It's a great place to work. Absolutely. Is there anything that I know we talked about a couple of different topics in your experience that we haven't kind of talked about today that you definitely want to just share with folks who are listening um, and are just curious about your career path or any other just thoughts in general? I will always like to ask. Ooh, well, my career path is unconventional. So for anybody out there who is tempted to 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 drop what they're doing and they've been doing it for so long, don't be afraid. Uh, Definitely reach out to myself or people in your network who have done the jump to other industries and, and be open to the advice on how to show your cross-functional skills or how to network, 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 network. Like if you're not networking in this space on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on any of those social networks, uh, you're, you're missing out. There's some dope people who are actually open to having conversations of their journey and how they've uh, grown in this space. Something that I'd love to talk about is uh, a methodology that I use in in most most ways when I'm thinking about diversity, equity, inclusion, and it's called the head, heart, hand method. And the reason why I bring this up most times is because a lot of people know it's a business imperative to have balanced teams. A lot of people know because you can throw a rock at the internet and land on some kind of information, some study with Harvard Business Review or McKinsey or whatever saying, yes, balanced teams produce better products, period, right? But there's a journey. Most people are stuck up here and they haven't made that journey to their heart where they actually care, (laughs) where they actually care because it affects them. It affects their families. It affects their teams. It affects their work environment. So my, my implore, my, what's that imploration? I don't even know if that's a word. My um, ask of y'all is to, to start to take that journey, to ask yourself, am I stuck in my head or have I made the journey to my heart? And once you make that journey to your heart, your next step is to actionize it and, and find ways that you can utilize your privilege, your power to actually empower people with tools, with opportunities to bring that change into your environment. And then the last thing I'd like to say is shout out to all my DNI practitioners. I see you. I know some of you are tired. I know some of you are thinking about transitioning to other opportunities. And I just <laughs> want to tell you like, hey, we have to be here for each other. We have to empower each other. We have to remind each other that we are here because we're passionate about this space. And um, don't let anybody take away your genius. Don't let anybody take away your shine. And if it does take time and you need a sabbatical and you need time to just rest, take that time to rest because you are no good to anybody if you're not putting the mask on yourself first. 
Absolutely. There's a lot of emotional labor that goes into this kind of work. And also, I think it's really important for folks to know, too, especially with your story, that you don't need 20 years of experience in DEI, like specific work at a company. Also, I would argue how many companies had a chief diversity officer or someone who's a programmer or anyone in this role, you know, 30 years ago as well. Um, So I would encourage folks to, like you said, lean on each other and also just, you know, foster their passion for for this work as well. Um, Thank you so much for, well, thank you. Speaking of, thank you for taking the time to be on our interview series today. We definitely appreciate it. And we'll link your LinkedIn and uh, Niantic's career website as well in our uh, page too. But it was so nice to meet you. And I definitely appreciate your enthusiasm and authenticity in our conversation. Thank you for your time, Christina. It's an honor. Absolutely. And as a reminder at All Voices, we believe in a psychologically safe workplace where all employees are empowered to speak up and think it's a necessity in order for everyone at the organization to succeed.